Hey all you heroes, hawks, heralds, crows, pirates, and wardens. Welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast, where we unpack, discuss, and galaxy brain about all the lore behind the Dragon Age series. We are so excited to bring you this podcast. Every episode, we'll be talking about a different topic in the Dragon Age universe, from character deep dives to exalted marches and elven gods. We will cover it all. There will be spoilers. And always remember, swooping is bad. Hello and welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast, where we talk about all things Dragon Age and its lore. I am one of your hosts, Austin, also known as Teacup. And I'm your other host, Shelby or Sheacup. And we are here to continue in our new season about the conflicts of Thetis. Last time we talked about the exalted marches against Taventer, or at least the first one. So where are we going today? Um, yeah, it's kind of funny because we have been in this season for like over two months, almost three months. I think we have like eight or nine episodes and, um, this is only the second Exalted March we've covered, but there's been other important things. We've done character deep dives, patron chats, all of the above. So today's episode is the second Exalted March, and this is the Exalted March against the Dales. I get the feeling I'm going to be pretty mad at the Chantry by the end of this episode. Mad at the Chantry, uh, maybe a little bit of an understatement. I was very upset uh, doing this research. It's it's very sad. It's very depressing. Um, there are some things about it that are reminiscent of real world history, for sure. There are also some things that are very different from real world history. Um, but overall, it's it's a really sad story. So so buckle in. All right. Well, I'm ready. So before I dive into some of the the trivia and fun facts, I just wanted to give a little bit of background. We've already introduced that this is the second Exalted March, but it did also occur in the Glory Age, which is the Second Age. And it lasted 10 years from 210 to 220 Glory. So just kind of diving into the trivia a little bit, this Exalted March is unique. It was waged by Orlay against the Elven Kingdom of the Dales. And the reason why this is unique is because this is the only Exalted March to involve forces from one nation fighting against one other nation. So almost all of the other Exalted Marches have been forces from multiple nations united under the banner of the Chantry against another group. So this one is different because it's just Orlay specifically oh interesting yeah and so you know you probably know if you've played the games you probably know that at the end of this exalted march the elves lose and they were presented with the choice to convert to the maker and then they can live in human settlements or they can strike out on their own but there are several elves in a group of them that choose a third option. And this option was to leap to their deaths off of a cliff instead of surrendering to the humans. The Emerald Knight Nomaris and the Elven General Rajmael both chose to do this. Interesting. And, and very heartbreaking, but at the same time, a very noble choice. I know we often think that Andraste is the one that gave the elves the Dales, the land of the Dales. And while she did promise them the land in exchange for them fighting with her, what I find interesting is that Mafarath is actually the one who gave them the land after Andraste was dead. Mafarath holds up that promise of Andraste, which I find interesting given... He betrays her. He never. We never get any indication in the lore that he particularly cared for elves. So I find mm-hmm. this interesting that he would hold up that promise when so much of Thetis history has been people breaking the promises they made to the elves. 
Right. It makes me wonder if like in the history, like maybe we know, maybe we don't, if the Chantry used the fact that Matharath gave gave this land to the elvish the elven people as justification for we need to take it back because the one who betrayed Andraste gave this land. I don't think there's anything that explicit in the lore, um, but I do feel like I remember a throwaway line in a codex that kind of alludes to that line of thinking. So in in world, I would imagine that that would probably have been an accurate thing that people said, um, but we don't have evidence of it in like the codex or games or anything. So my next trivia fact is that the journey that the elves took from Tevinter after the war into southeastern Orlay to the Dales to their new home is referred to as the Long Walk. This is really significant because it is reminiscent of real world history, which I talked about earlier, because in the United States, in um, Native American indigenous communities, when indigenous people were forced out of their lands, two of the biggest instances we have of this are named the Trail of Tears and the Long Walk of the Navajo. And so the fact that this has the same exact name as the Long Walk of the Navajo is really really significant to me and i think we can discuss if it's okay that the elves are kind of modeled after native american and jewish um communities in our real world that's a whole nother topic of whether or not it's right or wrong to do so but we can clearly see here in the lore that that is the influence and that is the inspiration i tend to not really have an opinion like Either way, on um, because I don't think this is necessarily like a bad analogy to this because I feel like it's not like over the head trying to be like, oh, this is exactly like this, but you can just tell that the writers of this used inspiration from our real world people groups to create a new and un and different people group. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. I also, I just feel like it's a little bit problematic, like, when we get into the lack of representation of black and brown elves. Um, And so when you're when you're using something as inspiration that happened to a group of people that are not white, that are indigenous, and then you make the entire group of people that they're inspired by white, or most of them, It just gets a little bit problematic, in my opinion. And I know that, like, not all the elves are white. I'm really not trying to imply that. Um, Most of them that we do see are. And even some of the ones that are companions that we get in game that are not white are often whitewashed um, by the fandom. I'm thinking specifically of Fenris. Happens very often. Um, So that's just kind of where my line of thinking is. Yeah, I definitely see that. And I think that this is a problem that comes in, not like with the conception or the idea of who the Elven people are, but the fact of representation in the writer's group of people from different backgrounds. Um, And I think that goes back to like the formation of Bioware. Like we know at least several of the main writers are not people of color. And so I think that's part of it. And so hopefully going forward, as Bioware continues to be diverse and goes on, we get a little better representation in there. Yeah, I hope so. I really hope so. Um, But I just have one more fun fact, one more piece of trivia left, and that is that if Briala rules alongside Gaspard, or if she is reconciled with Selene during the Wicked Eyes, Wicked Hearts quest in Dragon Age Inquisition, she is named Marquise of the Dales. This is the first time that the Dales have been ruled by an elf since the Glory Age. But let's move on into kind of the background and the context leading up to this Exalted March, because... If you've just listened to this podcast and you haven't dug into any of this research yourself, you may just, all you know is that the elves got the Dales um, after Andros Day's war, and that's all you may know. And there is actually more important and more 
like context to it than that. So before I jump into this, I want to explain that it is very, very important to remember throughout the rest of this episode that this exalted march, more than any of the others, has extreme differences in the story depending on whose perspective you listen to and whose perspective you trust. The Elven story of this event is extremely different from the Orlesian side. So while we discuss, remember this. We'll try to present both sides, but keep this in mind. I tend to trust the stories of the elves more than I do the stories of the Orlesians. So that's going to be like my bias. That's kind of where I'm going to come into it. But remember this as we start to present this information. So leading up to this exalted march is the context of the second blight. As a reminder, the first blot lasted from minus 395 ancient to minus 195 ancient, which is about 200 years. The second blight lasted from 15 to 195 divine, which is almost 100 years long. So two very, very long blights, uh, at least in terms of, of history and Thetis. And I know we've said it before and we'll say it again. These two blights were absolutely devastating for Thetis as a whole. The end of the second blight is just 15 years before the beginning of the second exalted march. So historically, that would be within the same era, even if it's technically two different ages, the divine age and, and the glory age. It's still within the same era context of history. Um so the events definitely would have impacted one another. And you have to remember that Thetis is going to be in a kind of rebuilding period again after this blight. But it's also important to note that the Glory Age is named because of the victory against the Darkspawn. Yes. Continuing in this vein with the blight, we know that the elves did not help fight against the second blight. They remained, quote, neutral is what the lore says. I don't particularly understand how you can remain neutral under an invading force like the dark spawn that want to attack and desecrate everything. Uh, that's unclear to me, but I think a more accurate phrasing might be that the elves refused to help the humans fight the second blight. Um, I think that if the second blight had truly reached the Dales, the elves probably would have had to step in and, and help fight with the humans, but uh, it didn't get that far. So we don't, we don't really know what would have happened. If this is true and that the elves refused, the important thing is, is that you have now set up a very, very easy to paint boogeyman. Yeah. And that's, that was kind of my whole point of bringing that up. And I'll get into more of that later. But for now, let's back up a little bit to the end of the last exalted march, which was Andraste's march to Tevinter. This is when the Dales were given to the elves as a new homeland, and they were given this land around minus 165 ancient by Maferath himself, as mentioned earlier. So when they first arrived in the Dales, they began to attempt to rebuild the culture that they'd lost because of Tevinter's destruction of Elvenon and Arlathon and the subsequent slavery. Tevinter's last and successful attempt to destroy Elvenon occurred in minus 975 ancient. This is about 800 years that the elves were enslaved in Tevinter without a homeland, without any alternative. So you can imagine just how much of their culture and religion was truly lost. To make it easy on us, though, let's assume most elves can live to be 100. I don't know if that's fact, but we're just going to make that assumption so that a generation would be about 100 years. That's over eight generations of elven knowledge. So for me, that would be my great, 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 great grandparent. What do you know about your fifth great grandparents? Do you know anything at all? Do you know their names? I only know mine because my dad is obsessed with Ancestry.com and has like a whole family chart. And that's the only reason I know mine even their names, but I don't know anything about them other that they were Swiss German. And that's only one set. Do you even know anything about yours? No. 
Not at all. Right. So I just wanted to use that as an example to kind of illustrate how much culture, knowledge, religion, just general everyday practices were lost over that period of time. So when they do get to the Dales, they're trying to restore all of that. They're trying to bring back everything that they've lost. They they returned to the worship of the Evaneris, even filling in the gaps with new beliefs. And when they built Halam Sharal, they vowed, their vow was that no human would ever set foot on their lands. And this was then, this was when they then established an elite group of warriors known as the Emerald Knights to enforce this vow and protect the Dale's borders and their independence. So I'm sure you can imagine just how much this would piss off the humans of Thetis, especially Orle and the Chantry. I can see Ferelden's kind of shrugging it off and being like, okay, and whatever, I don't care. Andros, they gave you that land, do whatever you want with it. Um, but I think uh, the Orlesians, of course, took special offense. And because of the blight, the relationships between the elves and the humans, especially of Orlais, was already strained. And so this was just one factor that helped it continue to deteriorate. And then the relationship between the humans and the elves became increasingly contentious when Emperor Draken I became the emperor of Orlais. And that's because he unified the cult of the maker, he outlawed worship of all other gods, and he made Andrastianism the official religion of Orle. Of course, the elves rejected the worship of the maker, and their existence in the Dales was a really big barrier to Draken's dream of expanding Orle. And of course, as you can again imagine, the Chantry did send missionaries to the Dales, and they were... Uh, sent back or killed and then they sent Templars and the same thing happened and it just uh, was not a good situation. This all happens after the first Inquisition and then the signing of the Navarra Accords. Yes. Because I remember because the first time I completed the Frostback Basin DLC in the Jaws of Hacken, I played as an Elven Inquisitor and one of your lines to a Meriden can be Draken betrayed us, and there is no, like, place for our people, and you basically get to tell a Meriden that, like, Orlay turned on the elven people. Right, and so the Navarran Accords were signed in 120 Divine, um, and so that line from the Elven Inquisitor is in reference to this Exalted March that we're talking about mm-hmm. today. Um, but I'm sure you can probably imagine... Or guess exactly where this is the situation is heading. The Dales become increasingly isolationist. The Orlesians become more pissed. The Emerald Knights get posted around the entire border, not just as a patrol. They begin rejecting all trade offers and all diplomatic attempts from Orle. And then the second blight happens and they refuse to help. And the Darkspawn made it all the way to the city of Montsimard, which is just a little bit west of the Dales. And the elves still refused to send warriors to help the humans. And so this obviously upsets Orle tremendously. And there was a rumor going around at the time that the elves even sacrificed humans to the elven gods, which why the Evanuris would want a human sacrifice is beyond me since they hate humans and don't want anything to do with them. But I think that's just a rumor in the lore. This just like shows that the Chantry, I mean, it just really kind of like is on the nose for like how colonization and other things have worked in our world, in our real world. Because if you knew anything about the Evanuris and their like belief system, making sacrifices to these gods doesn't make any sense from the belief system because their gods are locked away. They can't interact in the world. True. But as we know from our real world history, colonists tend to make a lot of assumptions. Or just make up in general. That's also fair. My last little point that I wanted to to bring up before the mid-break is that by 205 Glory, which is just 
right right before um about five years before the exalted march officially begins small fights were already regularly breaking out on the border between the dales and orlay so this exalted march is one that has already had a lot of fighting before it officially gets kicked off i think that would be a great place to leave it and go to our mid-break Ah, Hawk stepped in the poopy. I love you. Want a sandwich? All this for me. No, I didn't get Alexius anything. Send him a fruit basket. Everyone loves those. Well, welcome to the middle of the show where we talk about everything that has to do with the podcast, but doesn't have to do with the lore of Dragon Age. It's here where we thank our patrons. Thank you to all of our patrons. A special thank you to our first patron, Genesis, our Divine Tier patron, Kit, and our wonderful Nug King patron, Lewis H. Uh, you can join our Patreon and join us on the show and get our new merch. That's right. You might have known last episode, we launched our new merch. If you sign up at the Antiven Crow tier, which is the $10 a month tier, you will get quarterly stickers that were designed by the Fourth Lantern. You can follow her on Twitter. You can look on our Patreon or check out our Discord for what the stickers look like. There are lots of fun ones from Oabari to character deep dives to Andraste. And this Exalted March. But you can join our Patreon and sign up for that tier. If you can't join us on Patreon, we totally get that. Another great way to support us is to leave us ratings and reviews. If you leave us five stars and some kind words, we will read it out on a future episode of the show. And we do have a review to read today. Shelby, where does this review come from? This review comes from Johnny Porter on Apple in uh, somewhere that's not the United States because it was on Chartable. And Johnny says, great accompaniment to the series. Just started binging this lore cast as I start a new playthrough of the trilogy. You can tell the hosts really care about the world and its characters, which makes for an easy to listen to experience. It's definitely helped me gain greater knowledge of the world of Thetis as I start to explore the games once again. I'm even listening to it during my weekend walk with my faithful Mabari Warhound, Charlie. Keep up the great work, guys. Thank you so much, Johnny. That's an awesome review. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, if you leave us a review with five stars and some kind words, we will read it out on a future episode of the show. And also, you can check out our new website. It's still relatively new. Uh, it was made by Lewis H., one of our patrons, and uh, HIT Media Solutions. Uh, he made that for us. You can go check that out. That is cupspodcasting.com. And on that website, you can find the link to our Discord, the Cups Podcasting, and more. And that's all I got for the middle of the show. <laughs> oh, there. Giant icicle tits. Ice. Tittles. You're looking for titsicles. Oh, that's good. Yes, and it's a real nice night for an evening. Um... <laughs> oh, you fear barbarians will swoop down upon you. Yes, swooping is bad. All right, well, let's get back into it and let's get into the kickoff of this Exalted March. So the first half of this episode was all background and context and... You know, if you know me, I, I, my favorite part of history is figuring out what caused conflicts, not necessarily the conflicts themselves. So that's why half of this episode was all about context. So, um, but let's get into kind of the actual battles and kick off of this. So the thing that makes this exalted march an exalted march is the Battle of Red Crossing. And I think that this exalted march would have just been a war. Um, if it hadn't been for this specific battle. This event is really less of a battle and more of an overreaction, almost like Romeo and Juliet. Essentially, there are all kinds of rumors flying around that both elves and humans are kidnapping each other. At the same time, an elven woman was murdered by human hunters for coming too close to the border. At the same time as that, this woman's brother fell in love with another woman from the town of Red Crossing, which is the human town. Her name was Adeline, and she was also in love with the elven man, and the elven man's name was Elandrin. As you can imagine, this does not end well for either of them. 
They tried to keep their relationship secret, but Alandrin's many trips to Red Crossing became pretty obvious. The other elves, especially the Emerald Knights, soon figured out what was happening, and they didn't want him to leave the elves, and they really didn't want him to convert to the worship of the Maker for this human woman. But Alandrin does leave the elves before they can stop him and prevent him from going to his his girlfriend. And in response, the Emerald Knights went looking for him, but they went looking for him in the town of Red Crossing. When they showed up in town is when things start getting not good. Um, So when they show up in town, um, Adeline is the human woman. She was the first one to see them. And so she started like moving toward the Emerald Knights to go and talk to them. And she had something in her hand. The leader of the Emerald Knights was named Siona, ends up killing Adeline because she thinks that she's coming to attack them. Also, Siona is also a Landron sister. So this guy is just in a world of trouble. Um, and so the townspeople kind of see all this happen. They see the elves showing up in their town. They see the leader of these elf- this elven group attacking a human, a member of their own. And so they attack the elves in retaliation. Of course, the, the Emerald Knights are trained warriors going up against a, a village of just regular townspeople. And so they easily, totally defeat this town. But more and more humans do begin appearing over time, and this causes the elves to retreat back into the dales. Alandrin, if you remember, has already lost one sister. His lover is now dead, killed by his other sister. So he refuses to leave. He refuses to go back with the elves. And ultimately, he was killed and his body was dumped in the river. And we don't we don't really know if he was killed by his fellow elves or if he was killed by the humans of Red Crossing. That's left ambiguous. But this conflict is is what is marked as the beginning of the exalted march with the elves and the humans. And it's, it's because of this battle that the divine ends up declaring this war as an exalted march. Is the Chantry a religious organization or is it an arm of Orlay? Which one is it? And it needs to decide. I think that's fair. But I think you can also raise the question, is the Vatican part of Italy or is it the Catholic church? You know, technically it's its own thing. Technically. So is the Chantry. You can argue that the exalted March against Tevinter is religious. Well, it is very much religious, right? This one is not like the, it's just the fact that I don't think they really care that the elves won't convert to the maker. This is all political. It's all about the land. Does the divine just agree that Orle should expand this? And she finally has a reason to say, look, they're butchering the maker's children. They're butchering our the faithful. This battle of Red Crossing is the spark that the divine says, like, okay, this is too much. They're they're killing and attacking people. So she mm-hmm. uses that as the justification to declare an exalted march. And you have to remember, I've told this story from a kind of neutral perspective. The elves and the humans are going to tell it differently. The humans are going to tell the story of Red Crossing as the elves came onto our land and attacked one of our people. And then they murdered Mm -hmm. our entire village and they slaughtered us. And that's the story that's going to go to the divine. Whereas the elves are going to tell the story of they kill our people they wanted to steal our warrior and they started attacking us when we went to retrieve our warrior. So those are those are the different ways that they kind of tell this story differently. We do learn about Red Crossing and Dragon Age Inquisition. And I remember the tomb from earlier. It's the tomb of Dinan Hanan. Yes, he was an Emerald Knight. 
Yes. So, yes, exactly. So that's where we learn that this story of Red Crossing was never just as simple as the elves attacked the humans, which is what the Chantry and the humans have claimed forever and ever and was the cause of the Exalted March. So once the Inquisitor finds this information, you can either then give it to the Dalish tribe in the Exalted Plains or you can give it to Sister Andrea of the Chantry in Valroyo. I think just real briefly, this is a converse. This is like a choice that I wish I could give it to both of them. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. because on one hand, I think the people that need to hear this is the chantry. They're the ones who need to read this information. But also on the con side of that, odds are the chantry is just going to stuff it away in some library so it never gets out to the public. Potentially. I think it depends on who your divine is. Um, I usually give it to the Chantry because I think giving it to the Chantry has the potential for the most good in Thetis, especially if Liliana is divine. Like she's not going to let that just get hidden away anywhere versus like if you just give it to the Dalish tribe, like, yes, it is a piece of their history. And that's important and it should be honored, but you can still tell them about it without necessarily giving them the evidence is kind of the way I've justified it in my head, because I do think giving it to the Chantry gives the Chantry an opportunity to kind of atone and repent Mm -hmm. for the mistakes that they've made. And hopefully Mm -hmm. they learn from that. Right. I think that it depends for me. It depends with Vivian. But I think if you have a Dalish Inquisitor who is friends with Vivian, all three divines will do something about it. I can definitely see that argument. I think Liliana is the one who's most likely to do something about it. So let's get into the march itself. Um, I'm not going to do this like chronologically, step by step, because it would just be too confusing to be switching back and forth. So we'll do like the elven side and then the human side. And then the final battle. So in the beginning of this exalted march, the elves are basically winning at the beginning, uh, handedly, easily. They win a lot of major victories and they capture the city of Montsimard in Orlay in 210 glory, which is the first year that this was declared. And this victory was led by the Emerald Knight Varahel. And so, you know, when Divine Renata the first called this exalted march, as I mentioned earlier, Orlay is the only country that sent soldiers. However, there were some Templars that did join the exalted march. And regardless of this, though, the elves basically face no major resistance and continue pushing into human lands very easily. So this answered a question that I had several episodes ago, which I think it was in our okay. chantry. I think it was in our Chantry episode. And I wanted to know, like, when the Chantry calls an exalted march, are they just sending their Templars in to do this? Or are they sending command, ta- basically taking command of the armies of Thetis? And this says that it's the latter, but it depends on what sends there. But this is really interesting to me because I think it's a moment where the Templars... Like, they, as an organization, do not join the Exalted March right away, which indicates some level of independency from the Chantry itself. Yeah, that's fair. I think they could, I think that the Chantry probably could mandate the Templars, like, you have to do this um, if the Divine wanted to. But as we learn from Asunder, it's kind of like, who's going to enforce that, you know, if they decide, nah, we don't want to do that after all. But you also, I think another point of this is that the Templars are still fairly new. They're barely, they're not even a hundred years old as an organization. At this point, I'm sure a lot of them are thinking if we go out to fight, who's going to watch the mages? Yes, exactly. So getting back to it a little bit, by 214 Glory, which is four years into this exalted march, almost halfway through, The elves have pushed so far into human territory in Orlais that they were able to march on the capital, on Val Royo, the one and only Val Royo. 
They plundered and sacked Val Royo, including the tomb of Emperor Drake in the first. They even took the weapons and the armor that was buried with Draken. And they take all of their plunder and their stolen goods back to their capital of Halam Sharal, and they basically displayed it all as trophies. Not only were they able to plunder and sack Val Royo, but they were able to capture Val Royo. It's very, very significant. Let's switch to the human side for a little bit. Um, eventually, the humans do get some significant victories of their own, not just losses. Uh, most significantly, of course, they liberated Val Royo. The final blow of this battle was dealt by the Chevalier Sir Yves de Chevac. And this Chevalier famously struck down the commander of the Elven forces with a shot to the throat that was made from 200 feet away and using a bow that was named the Bane of Red Crossing. You can acquire this bow in Dragon Age Inquisition. If you complete all of the Astrariums on the Storm Coast, you can find it in the cave. So in 220 Glory, which is the year that this exalted march ends, Orlesian forces of humans, of course, captured Halam Sharal. Remember, this is the elven capital. So they've basically now done to the elves what the elves did to the humans. The walls of the city were so strong that they weren't destroyed at all. And the humans were easily able to breach the gate, of course. And so once the humans took Kalam Sharal, they, they never were able to recover the stolen arms and armor of Emperor Draken, even though there was quite a hefty prize that went along with returning them. They were never able to find his armor. You might think that... That's the end, that the humans were able to capture Halam Sharal, and that's the end of it. But that's not quite accurate. We do have a final battle. Even though Halam Sharal had fallen, that, that does not let the elves stop them from fighting. A group of the elven knights absolutely refused to surrender. And so they made their last stand. This final battle was located in the region that they referred to as Durthavarin. This meant the promise. This location is where modern day Thetis, the Dozians, refer to as the Exalted Plains. The elves were led by Emerald Knight Lindy Rene, while the Chantry forces were led by Lord Demetrius Aaron, Sister Amity, and Sir Brandis of Lac Celestine. Aaron and Brandis led the troops while Amity struck down the shrines to the elven gods and sang the chant of light. I put in the notes, ew, <laughs> at that. I just think it's annoying that you're just going to sing the whole time. Like, do something useful. The elves were severely disadvantaged in this fight just due to sheer numbers, but they did attack with ferocity and were even able to kill Aaron in the process. And on the battlefield, Lindy Rene and Sir Brandis faced against one another. Legend says that they dueled one versus one. However, research in the Dragon Age suggests that this is not true. Instead, Sir Brandis didn't want to see Lindy Rene die in vain, so he refused to fight her. Another soldier fired an arrow that killed Lindy Rene, and Sir Brandis then took Lindy Rene's legendary sword, which is named Evanura, to the Emerald Graves and buried it beneath a tree. This tree is one of the nine life tree landmarks that you can find in Inquisition. They are all called the Vallis de Lynn, and the tree that Lindy Rene's sword is buried in underneath is named for her. And so Lindy Renee's death is considered to be the official end of this exalted march. Do you have thoughts so far? Okay, so my first thought is this. I think that this later thing that we find in the Dragon Age is probably true because, like, I'm assuming Sir Brandis, he's a chevalier. And I know that, like, honor is a huge thing for them. Like, death before dishonor is there motto yeah and so i think that he would do that he would see like you're defeated like i'm not gonna fight you because there's no honor in beating you because i've already beaten you i imagine that he would be really pissed at this soldier that shot her yeah i think that's fair but i think this is a moment of like while i'm not i'm definitely not on orlay's side like 
you're a good chevalier at this point. Like you're adhering to like, you're truly seeing honor, not the whatever honor they make up modern day where they go around and beat up elves. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I definitely agree with that. The last thing is that I think it's really, really interesting that Solus's side quest takes place in this area because they really could have done it anywhere. It would have worked anywhere, but they chose to do it in the Exalted Plains, which is like the promise. And it's all this thing about the spirit that's become corrupted and everything like that. I just think that it's not that big a deal, but it's very revealing of like his character and like the mood surrounding his character that his side quest takes place where this atrocity happened. I agree with that. And I also think though, like thinking about where the veil is thin in terms of his side quest, this is Mm -hmm. the exalted plains is probably the place where it's the thinnest that we see in inquisition other than maybe skyhold. And of course where the breach actually is, but the emerald or the exalted plains is definitely a a place where the veil is going to be super thin because there's been so much fighting there and there's been so much death there right and it's also the site of the orlesian civil war like it that's where it's yeah happening i mean there are demons everywhere in that place yeah and that's what i would expect so let's uh, move on into the aftermath of this Exalted March because we'll talk about the Exalted Plains yet again. So after the final battle, the Elven Kingdom of the Dales was completely dismantled. Orle then claimed this territory as their own. The two regions that Orle claimed as their own were the areas of Dirth of Arin and Emerald March. Those were the names that the elves gave those areas. Dirth of Varen was renamed to the Exalted Plains, and the Emerald March was renamed to the Greatwood, to the humans. And the elves renamed the Greatwood area to be the Emerald Graves. It's really interesting to me that we get these names, we get the Emerald or we get the human name for the Exalted Plains in Inquisition, and then we get the Elven name for the Emerald Graves also in Inquisition, even though there's like a sub area within the Emerald Graves that's named the Great Wood. So I just found that to be super interesting, but regardless, the reason why the Elves have a different name for the Emerald Graves is because of the sheer number of people of Elves that were lost in the war. I think it's really telling that we decided the Exalted Plains and the Emerald Graves. I think it's just that they really wanted to link the Dales to this Exalted March and Inquisition. So they chose the names that link them to that the most. And I think, but it's also interesting to me because I also think it's a point of Bioware taking a step of saying like, we're going to call this the Emerald Graves because we really want to highlight like the plight of the elves that have found here. And to call it just the Great Wood one doesn't sound as cool. It just reminds me of like how the Emerald Graves actually are. Because you think of an Emerald Grave, oh, it's really pretty. It's really nice looking. Like it's very, very green. And that's how the Emerald Graves is. It's very pretty. But it's also very deadly and it's very sad. It's a grave. There's dead things inside of it, which I I think is excellent naming. Yeah, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, But to move on a little bit, Orle, once they took claim of this land, they also encouraged human settlements to be built. The first one was built in 221 Glory, which is like not even a year after the Exalted March is over. The very first one is Ville Montevellan, which is in the Exalted Plains. Sister Amity, the one who was singing, the one that's an idiot, became (laughs) its revered mother and presided there for over 40 years. And we know that Halam Sheral was settled by humans and the entire town soon became a retreat for wealthy Orlesians. But the capital, the center city, became the Winter Palace for the imperial family of Orle. I hate that. I do too. It's disgusting. I also, it makes me wonder, you know, with the Summer Palace in Tevinter that we learned about in Absolution, it makes me wonder if there's a similar backstory with that one too. After the war, though, I'm sure you can imagine that there would have been thousands, if not tens of thousands, of elves that are rendered homeless. So what happens? 
well, of course, the divine steps in to be the hero, sarcasm, in this situation. Divine Renata I declared that all Andrastian nations were required to allow elves to live within their cities, towns, and countries. This spanned borders as it applied to all Andrastians. However, in order to do this, the elves were also required to renounce their faith in the elven gods. They were required to convert to the cult of the maker or the chantry if they wanted to be accepted into human civilizations. Alienages were then created for the elves to live in. This is how we get city elves. As you know, though, many elves did refuse this offer, and that's how Dalish elves became known. So that's kind of how the two distinct groups of elves came to exist simultaneously. Elves that accepted Renata's offer became city elves, while those who refused became Dalish elves. At the same time, which I think this is probably the most important lore piece um, that happens as a result of this exalted march, and this is that Divine Renata ordered that the Canticle of Chartan, Andraste's elven follower, was struck from the Chant of Light, and she ordered that all Chantry art that depicted elves would be destroyed. The only piece of artwork that survived was a mural of Chartan, and actually his his ears were cropped to look like a human's ears, and so that's why the mural was allowed to be saved. Um, but that is kind of the aftermath, all of the consequences, all of the things that happen to the elves after they lose this war. Do you have thoughts about the Exalted March? I've said this before, but I want to say it again. I am pro-mage. I am on the mage's sides when it comes to the Chantry. But the Chantry's biggest crime is not against them. It is against the elves. This is the crux of all of it. This is the biggest crime. Not only do they capture their capital and make it for their own kind of colonial manifest destiny, promised, whatever. But they then force them into living as se- second-class citizens or nomads. Those are your choices. And then you are also a second-class citizen with no protection. And then they d- they completely rewrite and change their history to make it look like the elves were never a part of it or never a part of their faith or that Andraste didn't have compassion on them or that one of her biggest lieutenants and commanders and most beloved followers was an elf. Not on top of that, changing history to make rumors that Ameridan was not an elf as well. Erasing all of these elven heroes who are responsible for Thetis even existing in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it truly is despicable. I feel like the rewriting of history is really what seals the deal for me in that this is like they're trying to hide the fact that elves were ever even involved with the Chantry. Um, And so for me, that's just like it's a line too far in the sand. Like you can have conflicts with people like that's understandable in history. But to just like completely pretend they never even existed is frankly genocidal, in my opinion. Even Tevinter doesn't deny the elven involvement in Andraste's movement. True, which is is saying something. Th- this is what puts Orle in the same boat with me with Tevinter. Is like, okay, your system is corrupt and like there might not be any saving it. So I guess my question for you then is Tevinter still enslaves the elves. The rest of Thetis doesn't. So I, f- I feel like there is a difference there. Mm. Um, I know we can talk about, oh, you know, living in alienages and working as servants, like that's still a life of slavery. And yeah, it is in a way, but not the same way that it is in Tevinter. And so I guess my question is just, do you see a difference there at all? Or is it the same? I do see a difference. There is a difference. But to me, it's a difference of experience and not a difference of atrocity. You know, we see this in conversation with other elves where they're like city elves or, you know, Southern Thetis elves will say like, oh, well, we're free and you're not. And, you know, the Tevinter elves or other things be like, no, you're not. You just have a different master. And I think that, I think that saying that like, oh, you know, Orlesian elves have it better. I think we should say Orlesian and Ferelden elves have it different because I think that it's a lie that Ferelden and Orle tell to themselves 
and the free marshes tell to themselves to make them say like, oh, we're not as bad as Tevinter. Yeah, absolutely. Even though, I mean, I think that elves in uh, Orle, Ferelda, and other places, they probably have more choices than elves in Tevinter, but that doesn't make those choices good choices, you know. But I do have one discussion question before we get into our side character, and that's that was, do you think this Exalted March was successful? Why or why not? If we're talking about the Exalted, what was the Exalted March's purpose? Idraste's march was to bring down Tevinter. Tevinter's still around. Yes, the elves are still around, but they got the Dales. Was that their ex- was that their objective? Was it good? No. Was it successful? Probably. Yeah, I tend to agree with this. Um, I don't think that what happened was good. I don't think that the Chantry was justified in calling this Exalted March, but for the Chantry, yeah, this was successful. They got what they wanted, which was for the elves to be punished for the the Battle of Red Crossing and for Orlay to gain more land. So they got what they wanted at the cost of tens of thousands of lives and, you know, the entirety of elven culture. They just really kind of finished what Tevinter started. True. So let's get into our side character for a little bit, and it'll be pretty short because we don't know too much about him, but today's side character is one of the ancient elves that we can meet in Dragon Age Inquisition, and no, I'm not referring to Solus. We are discussing Abelos, who... If you remember, he's one of the sentinel elves that guards the temp- temple of Mythal, and Abelos is the leader of this group. Obviously, his Valislein is of Mythal. Does this suggest that Abelos was enslaved to Mythal during the era of Elvenon? I, I would venture to guess that yes, that is what that means. Yeah, I guess that is what that means. I mean, we have to agree that, like, do we take Solus's word for that? I do. I don't know why you wouldn't. It's interesting because like, I think it does suggest, but like, if you ask Abelos, if you talk to Abelos, he very much gives the eye of like, I'm pledged to Mythal. Yeah, true. But that just may be a him thing. Right. I just think that it's very nuanced and very like different words that are just, I think, when you take like in universes sources. But, you know, if we take thir- Solus as a third party source commenting on the Valisleen, then, yeah, he would have been enslaved to Mythal. Yeah. So anyway, Abelos guards the Temple of Mythal and appears to the Inquisitor when you and the party arrive. He claims that he and the Sentinel Elves are the last true devotees of the Temple and even of Mythal herself. Their entire lives are dedicated to protecting the Temple and, by extension, the Well of Sorrows. You would think that Abelos and his soldiers would be unaware of what's happening in Thetis, in modern Thetis, but that's not quite the case. He has a very strong dislike of modern elves, and he considers them to be Shemlin or the same as humans. Abelos and his soldiers do enter into Uthanera, which is the ancient elven practice of sleeping, that's essentially immortality, and they enter into Uthanera and come out of it when the temple is threatened. This is how Abelos and his soldiers have stayed alive for so long. Even though Abelos is hostile to modern Thetis generally, he is open to establishing a truce with the Inquisitor. Regardless of your choices, whether you establish the truce or not, when you arrive at the well, Abelos reveals that it contains the knowledge of all of the previous servants of Mithal. He fears that it will be lost if an outsider touches the well. If an alliance was established earlier, Abelos can be convinced to relent and allow the party access to the well. However, he warns that partaking from the well will bind the drinker to the will of Mithal forever. He contradicts Morgan's claim that Mithal was banished to the beyond by Fen Harel, stating that no, she was murdered by those who destroyed her temple, but the Dread Wolf was not responsible. Afterwards, he departs. And outside of the inner circle of the Inquisition, if people have even heard about Abelos, they just kind of think he's a weirdo Dalish guy. They don't know that he's an ancient elf. Historians in in world have basically determined that the Sentinel's arms and armors, which were brought back from the Arbor Wilds by Inquisition soldiers, to be of superb craftsmanship. 
but they don't believe that any cloth or metal could have survived untarnished as long as Abelos claims they have. Another interesting fact is that in the elven language, the name Abelos means sorrow. This is a really interesting companion in comparison to Solus's name, meaning pride. And I think that sorrow, I think he depicts sorrow very well um, when we meet Abelos. And also there's a codex entry from Origins in, uh, it's named the Brazilian Forest, and it tells the story of a Dalish elf named Abelos. So this may have been a common name. And then lastly, before we get into our thoughts, I brought a quote from Abelos, and he says this to an elven inquisitor only. Our people, the ones we see in the forest, shadows wearing Valisline, you are not my people. So what are your thoughts? It's interesting that Abelos shares similar attitudes with Solus, which I think does give a little bit of more credibility to Solus's story. Uh, because he says similar th- has similar opinions on the city elves and the Dalish that Solus does. I also think it just really stuck out to me, kind of leaning more into this, like the theory or whatever. But some of these elven words, you could tell me they were Kunari words, and I would believe you, like Abelos. Like I would, uh, I would. Uh, believe that's a rank in the uh the antom is it just is does it actually sound kunari or is it just because it starts with a no i really do think it sounds kunari (laughs) and i think (laughs) solace could also sound kunari as well i don't agree but that's fine you can think that i mean think about like elves the elven language uses a lot more like d and ih sounds than the kunari language does like the kunari language is much more um i would say phonetic and like hard like hard consonants and hard vowels but i i definitely see similarities in their like pronunciation and structure okay that's interesting yeah. Well, um, did you have other thoughts on Abelos before we kind of wrap it up? Um, I really like Abelos. I like his, adin- his addition to the lore. And I think that that quest alone is one of my favorites in Origins, even though, or not Origins, in um, Inquisition, even though doing the like, be nice to the Sentinel Elf's path is one of my least favorite things in Inquisition. But cause, mainly because I just get frustrated. That's fair. I um have never not done that. You just speed along and then he you it's hard to convince him to let you drink from the well of sorrow. I think you have to find Yeah, him. I just I just can't. Like, you know, who am I, especially if I'm not a Dalish Inquisitor, like who am I to say, No, I'm gonna ignore you? Well, the only person who really says like no, we shouldn't do the ritual is Blackwall and maybe Sarah. Because like Morrigan, Solas, Dorian, Cassandra, they're all like, no, like if we're going to mess around in these ancient elven temples, we probably should follow the proper rites of respect. Yeah, fair. Yeah, I agree. I like Abelos. I think that he was a really compelling character and I really wanted his armor. Unfortunately, we didn't get that, but I really wanted it. You can get the Sentinel Elf armor. You can, but it's not exactly the same. Oh, um, I will say this. If you if you as a player have not done this, you need to take Solus on this quest. I know that he's yes. not like the ideal meta build when you're building parties, but the lore things that happen between him and Morrigan and interacting with the portraits. If you have never done that, you need to do it. hundred percent for sure. Okay. All right. Well, that was, uh, that's about all I've got for this episode. I know it's kind of a long one. So if you are ready, we can wrap it up. All right. Well, thank you for this episode. It was a really interesting one. And I'm always here to talk about, the elven people and their plight in Thetis. And so thank you for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast, and we will see you next week.
Thanks for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. You can find us on Twitter at DA Lorecast. If you have any lore questions, topics to unpack, or side character suggestions, join our Cups Podcasting and More Discord server. It's easily the best place on the internet. You can also support us financially through our Patreon. You can find us there on patreon.com slash dragonagelorecast. The Dragon Age Lorecast is part of the Robots Radio Network. For more information about the Robots Radio Network, join the Discord server via the link in our episode description. If you enjoyed the show or learned something new today, please subscribe, leave us a review, and join the Patreon. And if you enjoyed our intro and outro music, give a big thank you to Pipe Man Studios. Thank you, Pipe Man. Thanks again for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. We'll see you next time. How well do you know your video game lovers? Have you ever wondered how your video game bays stack up against all the other delectable digital dates? I'm Genesis, the girl whose motto in life is love, laugh, tequila. And on Two Girls, One Ship, we analyze, rate, and review all that the world of video game romances has to offer. And I'm Vervada, the hopeless romantic cat lady and lifelong gamer. But you should know that our podcast centers on character and romance analysis and doesn't shy away from exploring the fun of physical connection. Or from the deep emotional connections built between two characters, using specific in-game dialogue and the overall narrative journey. So join the two girls, one ship, shipsters, and remember, beauty is in the eye of the controller.